So there's these questions we all ask, big questions that have a huge effect on our lives. But there's all this information out there that makes finding a solution difficult. So we came up with a better way to give you the answers that you need. We did a survey at Easter and compiled a list of your top six most asked questions. That list then became a roadmap for this message series. Each week, we'll examine a single question and discover God's answers based on His Word. It's a series we like to call, You Asked For It. Well, good morning. How are you today? Welcome online. If you're joining us, we are beginning this series. Well, we started last week, but it's a new series for us that we wanted to maybe start doing annually. Each Easter, we'll ask you questions. What did you want to hear? You know, we want your feedback. What do you want us to talk about? And so that's what we're doing. we kind of starting this for the first time based on last Easter. If you were here, uh, this week, hopefully we're answering one of, your, one of your questions. You're saying, hey, how, you know, how, last week we talked about how to uh, connect with the next gen. This week we're going to be talking about how to deal with difficult people. And if you ask for it, you probably have some difficult people in your life, right? I mean, how many of you would say, oh, that might be me, and, you know, don't look to the person next to you, right? Just, I mean, it, 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 that, you, we have them in our family, at school, at work. I mean, people, we have seasons when we have more than one. It's just like, oh, my goodness, what did I do to deserve this? And how do you handle that? I mean, what is the best way? I mean, we know what the world says, and we know maybe what our parents did, but how do we really know what God wants us to, how He wants us to interact with people? Uh, and, and so we're going to look at that today. In fact, I want to just look at some of the, it's not a whole list, but it's, there's a lot of difficult people out there. There's lots of flavors. But let me just give you five of the flavors right here. The first one, what I'm calling crazy makers, right? I mean, people that cause you a lot of, of uh, you know, anxiety and, and, and all the kinds of things that come along with people that are difficult. One is just people that are demanding. I mean, they're just, you know, they, they pound their fists down. They're, they're little Napoleons. They always want their way. They're pushy. You know, they're, maybe they're really bossy. They might try to intimidate you. You know, some people, that's their... That's their M.O., right? They Maybe in conversations, they, they're always dominating the conversations. They turn every conversation into a power struggle. They might have unrealistic demands. Then you have disapproving people, people that they're just nitpicky and, and they're critical, highly critical. Nothing you do is ever good enough. You try your very best and they're always looking for the negative. They always find the, you know, uh, the one thing that wasn't done as well as it could have been. They're, maybe they're unpleasable or they're per- perfectionistic. Then you have destructive people. I mean, they're just, they're, they go on a tear. Usually they have anger issues, but they go, I mean, they're, they're like volcanoes and lava burns everything, scorched earth all around them. You never know when they're going to come out with some kind of mean-spirited uh, comment or something they do. So everybody walks on eggshells around them. Then you have people that are just discontented. They get their feelings hurt so easily. They're thin-skinned. And they often have this kind of this poor me complex, right? They're always whining, always whimpering. They're chronic complainers. They're martyrs. Then there's the demeaning people that insult you. They're caustic in their language. They have constant put-downs. If you try to say something, they go, I'm only kidding, but you know they're really not, you know. It doesn't feel good, but that's their little weasel claws to get out of it. They're always deflating you. You tell them about a dream you have, and they're looking, they want to pop that balloon, right? They, they're, they're, they're always saying things to kind of tear you down because they don't feel good about themselves. They have their own insecurities, so how do you deal with people like this, difficult people in your life? Well, God actually does have uh, ways that he tells us, here's how to do it. Five ways we're going to look at them, but let me just say, as we get into it, each one is like more difficult than the previous. So we'll look at them, and there's actually an order. One's difficult, the next one's more difficult. It actually reminds me of what I, yesterday I was digging holes in our yard, because Sharon likes to go to uh, uh, the, the, you know, get trees at the hardware store, usually just plants. She'll come along, hey, I got some plants, can you dig a couple holes, and that's my ministry. 
at house at the house is uh, I'm a hole digger, you know. So yeah, no problem. So well, she brought home. She got she got these. She she gets them on clearance. She got these trees. So that's the first thing we celebrate. Oh wow, what a great deal! But I'm thinking all along, man, that's going to be a big hole, you know. <laughs> I'm gonna. That's not gonna be easy. And these are like some of these are bushes, and they're this big, and the, you know, these like trees. You have to make the hole way bigger because she wants to put compost and all that stuff in. So anyway, so I I start digging. Well, in our yard, there's layers of stuff. It starts out. It's already hard. I mean, it's you know, it's digging, but it, you know, it's topsoil, not too tough. You dig that, but then soon after that, it's like compacted dirt. It's not really soft or rich or anything it's just like compacted dirt then you get past that and there's like roots because we have a fair amount of trees in our yard so you all these roots and now you're digging at the roots and that's more difficult then we have big trees so some of the roots when you get past the first level of roots are these honking big roots I mean that no shovel is going through them and so I'm I've got, I've got this root axe I'm just hacking away at it and it was wasn't that hot, but if you're in the sun, it was hot yesterday. And if you're digging like I was digging. Then after you get through these big roots, then it gets to what we, down there pretty low, down there for the tree level is like rock hard clay. I mean, then you're like, I mean, sometimes you think you're like hitting a rock or some concrete or something. I just, I mean, this stuff's tough. So I'm digging some of these and I think I need some help. So I, I had a friend of mine bring over his auger. I'm thinking, yeah, auger, it's going to be easy. Actually, augers are tough, especially when you're going through roots and all that stuff. It, it, it's, it's better than just a shovel, but it's kind of like a jackhammer because it hits the root and it tries to leap out of your arms and I'm going down. And I'm pretty sore today, but got a good workout. I'm happy to report. But the, as you're going through this stuff, and the auger did help. It's nice to have extra power. Well, God wants to give you extra power. But as you go through, as you go through these levels, it's more difficult. So let's look at that. Let's look at the first level on how to deal with difficult people is to refuse to be offended. This is hard. This is hard because we can take it personally. Somebody says something, it hurts our feelings. You know, and you can tell yourself that's not personal, but it kind of feels personal. But listen, a mark of spiritual and emotional maturity is to recognize it is not personal. It is about them. It's always about them. They're trying to make it about you, but it's, it's their issue. They're the ones carrying that stuff with them. I was at the gym about, I guess, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, something like that. Normally, I have my headphones because I get in the zone and I hit the weights and do the thing, my, my routine. Well, I... I guess it, I can't remember why, but I didn't have my headphones on. I think my, my batteries probably ran out. So I'm, I'm working out, and I hear this, this guy is walking around. He's a big dude, and he's walking around looking for somebody to talk to because he, he wants to tell him his, you know, uh, how he intimidates people. So I, I thought, well, I won't look him in the eye, and he'll leave me alone. So I'm looking away, but I'm listening because he's real loud, and he's not far from me. He's looking, he's going up to people, yeah. I love to intimidate people. I get my way. And he's mostly talking about like, you know, clerks at, you know, at, at, at stores. And, you know, and I just come up and I start yelling. I start arguing. And next thing you know, I get what I want. And, and he probably does, right? I mean, a big guy screaming, intimidating. Most people will acquiesce. Now, some people will just punch him in the face. And he probably deserves that, right? But, but most people won't. And they just, well, okay, whatever, you know, back off, you know. But he's the problem. He tries to make it look like they're the problem, but he brings that with him. And so recognizing, hey, I, I choose to not be offended. I'm going to refuse to be offended is recognizing it's not worth it. No, hey, there are some things in this world that are offensive, and we do take it personally. I mean, Injustice in the world. When I know there's people starving at night and I live in a land of plenty, that, you know what, that offends me actually. Racism in our country and racism around the world, but still in our country, that offends me that that's still going on. There's babies that are being aborted instead of being treated like a human life. That offends me. Sex trafficking and abusing people, that, that offends me. There are things in the world I'm not saying we just go around like robots, you know, nothing offends me. No, there's some things that offend me. But 
when somebody, it's their issue, and they're just, you know, spewing toxic verbiage and stuff. Hey, that's on them. I refuse. I refuse to get offended because that's a mark of spiritual and emotional maturity. He says, do not say, I'll do to them as they have done to me. That's so, so many people, that's their, that's their MO, right? That, that's how we were taught. Somebody punches you, you punch them back, you punch them harder. They'll learn their lesson, you know, and, but the Bible says, no, we're not going to do that. We're not into the retribution and retaliation. I'll pay them back for whatever they did. That's what the world does. We don't do that. In fact, the truth is, it's a good thing to be, to have thick skin, to have a thick hide, you know, hey, you know, I don't get offended easy. In fact, that's a good prayer. God, give me a tender heart and a thick skin, right? I, 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 because that will actually bring you a lot of happiness. It's not the key to all happiness, but it'll help a lot. If you say, if I, I, have a thick, I have a thick skin, but, but some, you know, the world, a lot of it's the reverse, right? They have, so many people have thin skin, but a tough heart. We want the opposite. God, give me a tender heart and a thick skin. When a fool is annoyed, he quickly lets it be known. Everybody's going to know. You, anno- you annoyed me. You offended me. It's coming right back at you. Smart people, wise people will, what? Ignore. Ignore an insult. That's a sign of wisdom, of smarts. Why? Because you're able to look past that. Because you know, if you're smart, if you're wise, you know that when somebody is being abusive, is being demanding, is being demeaning, all these things we looked at, that that is because they have an issue. They're in pain. They have insecurities. They have fear. They're reacting from that. And we might not know what's going on in their life. You know, people at work, if you don't know what's going on, and they act, you know, they act in a way that's offensive to you, it's because we don't give them any slack. We don't know what's going on in their life. You know how it's different when you know somebody's journey? You think, oh, man, they're going through all of that. They just went through that divorce. They just went through that bankruptcy. They just went through that, that, that loss that they had. Or, I mean, we give people a lot of slack, right, because we know their story. But listen, it's a sign of maturity. It's a sign of being smart when you know, you don't know directly, but you just know, hey, there's, they're hurting people because they're hurting. Hurt people hurt people. They're hurting. Something's going on in their life. They woke up on the wrong side of the bed. Something happened to them, and so they're lashing out at me. But smart people, they don't take offense. They get it. You know, you, I wonder what the cause is. Something going on, and that's an act of love when we do that. The Bible says love overlooks the wrongs that others do. You want to be loving? You don't just ret- give retribution, treat people like they deserve. You treat them like God treats us. He loves us even when we don't deserve it. Number two, going down a little deeper, this is harder for many of us, refuse to gossip. Refuse to gossip. Now, our tendency is to do that, right? Somebody's just wacko, you know, freaks out on you and all kinds of stuff. And they're, the first thing we do is we get in the car, we call somebody, right? Can you believe what so-and-so did? Sometimes we don't wait that long. We start texting as they're doing it. I'm on to you, buddy, you know, or, or, you know, this is going to be posted. It's going viral. I'm like, you're going to have it. And our tendency is that's, that's right. And that's a way of, of kind of getting them back. It's a form of retribution. It's a form of retaliation to gossip to other people who aren't even part of it. And they don't get to hear both sides of the story. Anyone who overlooks an offense promotes love. So we already looked at that, right? The loving thing to do is to overlook an offense. But somebody who gossips separates close friends. Gossip, gossip destroys businesses. Gossip destroys uh, families, churches. It's not, now what is gossip? Because I know sometimes we use that in different, different ways. Well, here's what we're talking about. Sharing information with somebody who is not part of the solution or part of the problem. 
way we like to talk about it here at Vineyard is, is every, each person has two buckets. One's filled with water, one's filled with gasoline. When you come across a fire, which is some, somebody doing something, you can either pour water on it or you can pour gas on it. Hey, look at that fire. Watch what happens now. Throw some gas on it. And some people, they, that's, that's, what, that's, that's what gives them joy, right? They love to see just things go up in smoke. But that's not the loving thing to do. And so we want to have restraint in our life. Restraint in our life. It says, do not do wrong to repay a wrong, and do not insult to repay an insult. But here's what we do. He says, with a blessing, repay with a blessing. We can't do that in our own, right? Everything in us says, it's the last thing you deserve. Well, it's not about them deserving it. That's what, why would we do that? Because you yourselves were called to do this so that you might receive a blessing. So God says he's watching. He says he's watching how you respond to the difficult people in your life. And if you can respond with a blessing, he will give you a blessing. God gives us. That's how, how do we get blessings from God? Here's a key way that it happens. A key way. We refuse to gossip. We refuse to be the complainer type. Vineyard USA is going through a big reorganization. That's the vineyard, the 650 vineyards throughout the United States. And Sharon and I play a role in some of that. We're regional leaders of the Mid-Atlantic region. We oversee the Carolinas and the Maryland, Virginia. That's about 35 pastors and their churches. And, we, you know, we've done that now for uh, coming up on nine years. And not everybody's doing well, right? With, not everybody does well when there's change. Even when there's good change, not everybody does well. So some people, some pastors, these regional leaders, because there's 16 of us, you know, and I'll be talking to them. Some of them, like, they're not doing well. You know, they're, they're, they're falling into complaining. I, 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 my advice to them is, hey, listen, if you can't do this with joy any longer, you probably, this is the end of your term. You, you should just step out. If you're going to find yourself, you know, spreading, you know, spreading the rumor chain and complaining and all, you're not being helpful any longer. And, and I'm kind of counsel to myself as well. You know, we, we all need to do that because we, we have, when, we're, when we're stressed out, when we're bent out of shape, our tendency is to gossip. We've got to be careful we don't fall into that. Refuse to play their game. Now, people will play games, and their games, are, you know, they're mind games. And people try to get, suck you into playing their game. And you can't convince them out of it because they didn't get there logically. They're reacting emotionally. When somebody is motivated emotionally, do you, you know, in your mind you're thinking, oh, if I just talk, to this, they'll come to the conclusion, oh, yeah, I see, yeah, that, I shouldn't do that. No. If they got to that conclusion, what, what they're doing from an emotional reason, they just get mad at you when you try to talk to them logically. You know, there's no reasoning in prejudice, for example. Somebody who's, who's already figured, in their mind, you're a bad person. They're going to just, everything they, th that comes their way, they're going to try to attach that and reinforce that image. Yeah, see, I knew you were bad. See, I knew you were bad. That's true with, if they think you're good, they'll do the same thing. But that, I mean, there's no reasoning to that. So, People are just going to think what they, what they want about you. And you. I mean, there's certain parts of that. You just can't control that. But you, choose, you decide, I'm not going to play uh, this game, this, this get sucked into your little traps that you set for me. Now, Jesus had the same thing. People were constantly trying to play mind games with him, trying to trap him, particularly this group called the Pharisees. They were a religious group. They didn't like Jesus. And they were always setting little mind, mind game, mind traps out for him. And uh, here's what he did. He says, the Pharisees plotted a way to trap Jesus into saying something damaging. They sent their disciples with a few of Herod's followers mixed in. Now, there's, a, there's plenty of, of people that are, that are crazy makers in your life. They don't operate alone. They'll pull any kind of strings they can to get other people to do their bidding also. Kind of like with... Uh, uh, the Wizard of Oz, remember that? With uh, uh, Dorothy and Toto and then the th three little characters that with her. And the person always trying to harm them was the Wicked Witch of the West. 
And she did it not just by herself, but with the flying monkeys, right? Go get them! You know, the flying monkeys coming in to harass them, and they were always doing her bidding. Listen, you have people in your life, they don't operate alone. They've got employees that are afraid of being fired, and so they're kind of doing their bidding. Sometimes it's a family member who's afraid of, of being on the wrong side with mom or dad or not being in the will. There's all kinds of reasons why people will serve as a flying monkey, but many times they're not alone, which makes it more difficult, which makes it more difficult. But you still don't play their game. It says Jesus knew they were up to no good. He said, why are you playing these games with me? Why are you trying to trap me? So he just called them out on it. He wasn't going to play, he wasn't going to just ignore the obvious that's going on. He goes, you're up to no good. I see it. It's a game. I refuse to play this game with you. The apostle Paul, he, same thing. He would not play the manipulative games that people would try to play with him. He says this to the Corinthians. He actually tells him, he chides him, he says, hey, don't do that. He goes, we reject all shameful deeds and underhanded methods. He goes, listen, don't fall for that kind of stuff. Those games, underhanded methods, the traps people set. We don't try to trick anyone or distort the word of God. We tell the truth before God and all who are honest know this. Some people, they, they love conflict. It's just part of what gets them fired up. And so they're always looking to stir things up. There's, you know, everybody wants approval. And when we can't get approvals, often we'll settle for attention. Kids do it all the time. I mean, kids at school, kids in homes, they're not, they don't feel like they're getting approval, so they start to act out. They do all kinds of bizarre things. They say bizarre things. They have bizarre lifestyles, and they dress bizarre. I mean, and they're trying to get attention because deep down, really, what they want is approval. But it's not just kids. Adults do the same thing, looking for attention. It happens all the time on the Internet. People posting stuff social media or some blog, some crazy philosophy, and they're really just trolling, looking to see if they can get anybody sucked into it. And it can happen real easy, right? We're looking through, hey, that's crazy. I got to respond to that, you know, and you got to jump into that, that discussion, and you might not even know who they are. And, and there's somebody on the other side going, whoa, I caught one. They're like fishing. Oh, it's a big one. Yeah, you know, and here's what you, those people have way more time than you, and they thrive on conflict. It'll never, it'll never be resolved. Nothing is resolved. Come on. I've seen, I've read plenty of threads. I've never seen it all kind of come together. Oh, we all agree. Isn't this beautiful? No, that's not how it goes down. Here's, I love this by Neil Stevenson, a syndicated columnist. He says, arguing with anonymous strangers on the internet is a sucker's game. Because they almost always turn out to be self-righteous 16-year-olds possessing infinite amounts of free time. And they have a whole lot more free time than you. And they'd be happy to go on and on and on in this argument longer than you want. That's so true. So we've got to be careful we don't get sucked into it. One of the things that tends to pull on my string, and I almost get sucked into it, is reviews on the church. I know that it's a church. It's not a business like, you know, an automotive shop or a, you know, a cleaning service. Something. This is different. But I still, you know, I mean, we've gotten some, so many amazing reviews over the years for Vineyard Church. But there's always a few people that say something, not just like, you know, I didn't like the worship. I mean, they're like, you know, a little more poignant, a little more, you know, angry. I always know them. You know, I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. I know what... You, you were under, you know, we had to ask you to stop doing stuff that you was destructive in our church, you know, causing all kinds of problem. But I don't say that, right? Because I, I can't do that. I got to protect people's dignity even in the midst of their deprivation. I mean, we can't do that. Now, I fantasize on it. Yeah! <laughs> you should have seen what this person told me, you know? I mean... Or what, how they were leering at children and following him into the bathroom. Or how they screamed at our staff and we had to call the cops. They don't put any of that stuff in. They just put, oh yeah, then you da da da. You know, they just say all this. And I'm thinking, calm down, Andy. Back off. 
It's easy to have. You know, we're not the first generation. You can go back hundreds of years, all the way back. Look at this American Revolution. Thomas Paine said, to argue with a person who has renounced the use of reason is like administering medicine to the dead. <laughs> Isn't that how you feel sometimes? Like, what's the use? What's the use? The troublemaker always has a clever plan and won't look you in the eye, but the one who speaks correction honestly can be trusted to make peace. So our, we're looking to do our part, right? But it, listen, in an argument, there's two people involved. You can't control the other person. You certainly can control yourself, which actually ends an argument because it takes two. So you just step out and say, ah, I'm not going to participate. I'm not going to participate. Just as charcoal and wood keep a fire going, a quarrelsome person keeps an argument going. So you just step out. I'm not going to be part of that. I refuse to be part of that. Disharmony is very disruptive to any kind of organization, whether it's at a work, churches, families, disharmony. And if you're a boss of a few employees or even several employees, you have the, the, you have the ability to hire and dismiss people. You owe it to your other employees, to the rest of the team. If you have a troublemaker, you have a quarrelsome person, you have a, a constant complainer, you owe it to the team to provide harmony. It, first thing, it's very, very destructive on productivity for your company. But also, you, your team deserves to have a place where they can have harmony, where they can, and so you owe it to, to get rid of them. You go, oh, I don't like firing people. You owe it to them. You owe it to your company. You owe it to the team that you're part of. Proverbs 22, 11, it's not on your outline, but it says, throw out the mocker and you'll be rid of tension, fighting, and quarrels. You know, in Titus 3, 10, it gives an instruction. It's actually to pastors, but it certainly applies to, to, uh, to you. I mean, he says that, hey, if somebody is quarrelsome, they're constantly uh, backbiting and complaining, he goes, you warn them once, you warn them twice, the third time, you graciously invite them to look into being part of another church. <laughs> That's a kind way of saying, hey, listen, it's not working out here. You know, you're, you're destroying the harmony of this, of this organization, of this body, of this church body. And so the, God says, I want you to do that because sometimes I think we underestimate the harm that happens with a quarrelsome person. Number four, we're getting deeper now. This is really hard. Refuse to cave in. Refuse to cave in. When, when there's a lot of pressure on us, is there's a temptation to, to acquiesce, you know, and just to cave in. Especially if you have somebody in your life who has poor boundaries. Somebody who is unscrupulous. Listen, somebody like that, if they sense you're just a doormat, they will run right over you. And you say, well, I think that's what the loving thing, that's what God wants me to do. No, he doesn't. I mean, this is, this is a myth, I think, that somehow we bought into that we're supposed to be some kind of doormat. The Bible never says that. You know what Jesus said? If you get slapped in the face, turn your, you know, your cheek to the other, you know. Would you really do that? I wouldn't. Why? Because you don't, that's, listen, Jesus was talking in the Sermon on the Mount there. He was saying that you've heard in the Old Testament, it said an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. He goes, we're not going to be the kind of people that have a spirit of re retaliation. So he says, listen, you don't, you're not looking to retaliate. So there is a balance, right? We're not, we're not retaliatory. We're not going to just do a tit for tat. Whatever they do, they get back. No, we're not. But at the same time, you put a line in the sand and you go, you can't take advantage of me. That's, in fact, that's the loving thing to do. The loving thing to do to yourself, for others, and to God is to say, you will not take advantage of me. Now, it doesn't mean you don't forgive. We always forgive. But forgiveness and trust are different. That's why some of you still haven't forgiven the person that's hurt you because you think they're the same thing. But forgiveness only takes one person, and that's you. Why would you forgive? Because by forgiving, you release that. You don't have to carry that. It doesn't affect you. It doesn't affect your relationships, your sleep, your peace. You let that go because they, they win if you keep harboring that, holding on to that. Also, Jesus said it's good to forgive because you'll need forgiveness in the future. 
And so it keeps that, that, that access point between you and God. But trust is different. You see, if somebody hurts you horribly, they beat you or whatever, you forgive them, but it doesn't mean you let them back into your life. In fact, trust often is never earned because it does take two. It does take two. But you do forgive. But forgiveness, because we understand forgiveness now, forgiveness means it does not mean that you, when you hurt me, I forgive you, but I'm going to let you keep hurting me. That is not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness means I'm, gonna, I'm not going to hold on to this. I'm not going to let this embitter my spirit. But it doesn't mean I'm going to let you keep taking advantage of me. That is for sure. So we refuse to cave in. If somebody asks you at work to do something that violates your conscience, you refuse to cave in. You refuse to cave in. If, somebody, if at work they give you a schedule, you no longer can participate in worship anymore. Coming together with the saints. You refuse to cave in. If you're at a little league game and you hear people or at the break room and you hear people dis- making disparaging comments about Christ or Christ followers, you refuse to, to cave in. Do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. You don't allow it. You say, well, aren't Christians supposed to be meek? Yeah, but meek, as the Bible understands it, is it was, it was a Greek term. The Bible was written in Greek in the New Testament. And it, was refer, it referred to like animals that were like a stallion, some kind of animal uh, that, would, that, was bro- that would be broken. In other words, it was wild. It was out of control. And then they broke it. And, they, and, and now they, you know, they, uh, it could be used for the master's purpose. Was the, was the animal weak or no? So weak is not, I mean, meek is not weak. Meek means I, I have the strength that God gives me and I'm going to operate it as God wants me to. In that kind of strength. Not in a vengeance way, but also I'm not a doormat. There, you, each of us, you, God has given you strength to stand up against all kinds of evil and people that would want to take advantage of you. Don't let people intimidate you. You refuse to cave in. In fact, you let people, Paul says, make slaves of you. So he's saying, you shouldn't be doing this to cheat you and to steal from you. So he's saying, Corinthians, don't do this. He goes, why? You even let them strut around and slap you in the face. That's not what we're supposed to do. He goes, you draw a line. Hey, no, no, no you unscrupulous person, you person who's out of control, demanding, demeaning, all these kinds of things. Uh, I'm not going to let, let you do that to me. Even You even put up with anyone who enslaves you, same verse, just different translation, and exploits you or takes advantage of you and puts on airs and slaps you in the face. God does not expect you to be a doormat. If you got that message from somewhere else, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, but also I want you to walk in freedom. You do not have to be like that. God wants you to walk in a, in, a, in a way where you're not manipulated, you're not controlled by people, you're not pressured to do things, you don't live under people's expectations. In fact, there's a whole book in the Bible that talks about that. It's the book of Galatians. Paul wrote that as well. He started a church in Corinth, chartered, started a church in Galatia, which is in Greece, and he says, hey, Walk in the freedom that God has for you. You don't have to walk under somebody else's condemning voice. He says, we have freedom for Christ has set us free. We must always cherish this truth and firmly refuse to go back into the bondage of our past. You know, there's people that will try to bring up your past to keep you in bondage. One of those people, well, he's not a person, is Satan. Satan's always trying to do that. Yeah, but remember what you did. Remember what you did. But people sometimes operate under those same marching orders and try to hang that over you. God says it's all about where your feet are headed now. It's all of, that's, because, that's called grace. We, you know, Satan would try to hold that stuff over us. You don't have to, you don't, and, and people will, they, they sense that. Oh, there's something going on there. And they will capitalize on that and try to use that, shame you, intimidate you. Don't let that happen. He says, don't let that happen. Walk in the freedom that God gives you. Look at, I love this verse here in Matthew. It says, the disciples came to Jesus and asked him, do you realize you offended the Pharisees? Oh, no. The Pharisees are offended. No way. 
I mean, he's the son of God. Can you imagine the disciples are going, you're probably too much on the edge, Jesus. Some people are getting offended. People get offended all the time. You know, even God can't please everybody. Some people are praying for it to rain. Some people praying for it not to rain. Somebody's upset, right? If God can't do it, you can't do it. So you live the life God's given you to live. Don't worry about if people are offended. Certainly Jesus did not. What did he say? He said, Jesus replied, every plant that that every plant not planted by my heavenly father will be uprooted. Key point now, watch this. So ignore them. Good advice. I'm offended. Okay. You, you, yeah, you know what? I'm going to get in trouble. I can see. I better not, I better not do that. It's just, you know what? You, you might, I, sometimes I just listen, you know, but you're ignoring them, right? You're ignoring because it's not worth your time. Lastly, number five, and, pro- and the most difficult, you always take the high ground, regardless of what other people do. You take the high ground. You're loving even when they're not loving. You're kind when they're mean. When they insult you, you respond by blessing them. It's total- You're 100% in charge of how you respond. Ask God to bless those who persecute you. You go, yeah, nobody's persecuting me. Well, you have crazy makers. You have people that are, di- that are causing you all kinds of problems in your life. Those, what do you do with those people? You ask God to bless them, not to curse them. That doesn't come natural for any of us, right? That's not our first instinct. Oh, wow, that really hurt. Well, God, would you bless them, <laughs> right? No, but that's a mark of spiritual and emotional maturity we're walking toward. We're walking toward that. We're not going to play their game. We're not going to take take it personally. We're not going to cave in. We're not going to gossip. We are going to take the high road. If somebody has done you wrong, do not repay him with a wrong. Try to do what everyone considers to be good. Do everything possible on your part to live at peace with everybody. Now, it's not always going to happen because you can just do what's possible, which is what you can control, which is you. Some people, they don't want it. They don't want it. They're not ready. They, there's all kinds of motivations that are going on in people why they have no interest in it. A good illustration of this is from the, from the Old Testament, King David. You know, he fought Goliath, beat Goliath, David and Goliath. And then King Saul, who was king at the time, brought him on staff and he was, a, he was a military commander. He played music, all kinds of things. Well, a prophet said David would be king next. Actually, David would be king like quicker than Saul wanted it. Saul became enraged, jealous, tried to kill him. David runs for his life. There's people with him, some men with him. They're hiding for seven years. Saul's hunting him down like a dog, trying to kill him any way he can. Two times, two times, David has an opportunity to kill Saul and end it all without without being caught. Once he's in a cave, Saul goes in to go to the bathroom and the guys are there with David, they're whispering because they don't, Saul doesn't know they're in that cave. And they go, we can kill him now. He goes, no. And then there's another time that happens with his spear when he's sleeping. They go, well, why? We don't get it. We're on the run. Our life's miserable. Why are we not going to kill him? If he's trying to kill you, certainly murder would be okay for you, David. David says, no, from evildoers come evil deeds. In other words, just because he's a murderer doesn't mean I am. I don't operate out of retaliation. I, I, he's taking the high road. It's hard to take the high road. There's a cost. For David, it cost him seven years of all, being on the run and all what that meant. If you want to read that, it's, it's in there in first, the book of 1 Samuel in the Old Testament. It's difficult to take the high road. There's a cost to it, but that's why it's the hardest. Taking the high road. Look at this verse. Never let evil defeat you, but defeat evil with good. There's a lot of evil out there. There's people that are demanding or disapproving, destructive, discontented, demeaning. They will cause all kinds of havoc in your life. But you decide, 
up front, I am not going to be like that. I am going to defeat evil with good. I think when we get on God's, when we get on the same page with God, the favor of God comes upon us and our relationships and some miraculous things can happen. Here's what I believe God wants for you today. This last verse. When people's lives please the Lord, even their enemies are at peace with them. Some of you have long-term enemies. People that are troublemakers, crazy makers, quarrelsome. There are all kinds of problem in your life. And God is going to do something amazing. He's going to bring peace. I believe that. That's God's word. And upon your relationships, you have, and you're thinking, you gave up hope a long time ago. God's going to resurrect the hope. Say, I have more work to do there. Let's bow our heads and pray. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm going to invite you right now to pray with me. You go, Andy, what does that look like? Well, I'm going to lead you in prayer. And you just, if it resonates with you, you kind of reflect on it. God's listening. And you say it, either whisper it, or you think it, or you just pray it in your heart, however, however you want to. But you, you just respond back to God. Okay? You say, God, if this is true for you, say, God, that person has hurt me. It's a fair amount of pain from that. But I want you to use it for good in my life. Not that you caused it, but use it for good. Help to grow me emotionally. Help to grow me spiritually. Would you say, God, help me to not Take offense easily. Give me a tender heart and tough skin. Help me not to take things personally. Help me to see through whatever behavior or whatever they're saying, to see the fear, the hurt, the pain, the insecurity. There's stuff going on. Help me to overlook. Overlook offense by having eyes of love. Would you say, God, help me to forgive. Maybe you misunderstood what that meant in the past. You thought it meant trust. You thought it meant reconciliation, that it was rebuilding a relationship. No. This is all about you. Would you say, God, help me to forgive. Help me not to retaliate with gossip. I don't want to play people's games anymore. Maybe you have somebody trying to manipulate you, intimidate you, suck you into some kind of game. Why don't you just declare it ends today? Regardless of the fallout, it ends today. We say, God, help me to not cave in. I'm tired of caving in. I don't want to allow what I know is evil to be called good. Give me courage to speak up, courage to stand up, to take the high road. If you've never asked Christ into your life, that is your next step. You can't do any of the stuff we're talking about without a, a higher power, just like I had that auger to help me to get through. You need something bigger than you because human love, human patience just wears out. So I invite you to call upon the Lord right now. I want to invite you and to follow me in a prayer for that. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, if that's you, if you're here today and you say, you, I need more of God. I need the Lord. I need him to help me, to restore me. I'm going to invite you to pray. Just follow me. It's not about joining the church. I'm not going to ask you to come forward or stand up, anything like that, right where you're at. But with boldness and courage, I'm going to ask you to let me know, say, I want to pray with you right now. We do that. Just raise your hand. If that's you, say, I want to pray with you, Pastor Andy. I want to pray with you. Okay, bless you. Yep, I see that hand. Yep, in the back. Who else? This is your moment. I'll give you another moment. 
Yeah, I'm ready to pray. I'm ready to receive Christ into my life. Okay, I see you back there. Yep. Okay, put your hands down. Pray this with me. Say, today, God, I want a fresh start. I invite your Holy Spirit into my life. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me, forgiving me. Lord, I pray that you empower me. Lord, I pray that you bring peace in the midst of my relationships, even people that I've deemed as enemies. You do it by your work. I can't do it. I've done it. I've tried. You do that. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Would you put your hands together and congratulate those who prayed to receive Christ and take a step for Christ. You know, we all have next steps. And I'm so thankful for those of you who prayed to say yes to God. Let me know about it. On the, if you're watching online, you, there's a way for you to do that. You can write on the Connect card that's, that was given to you as you come in. Um, we have step three right after the service. And uh, if you're, we'd love to have you be part of that. Uh, join us in step three. Also, if you'd like to support the vision of this church to help people to know God, uh, find freedom, discover the purpose, make a difference, uh, there's some ways that you can give. You know, just this past Wednesday, we had 90 kids show up for an event we did for them, and 19 of them made a decision for Jesus Christ. That's awesome. We didn't charge, we didn't charge them a dime because you paid their way. Thank you so much for your faithful giving. It's making a difference. Well, let's stand together, and we will... Uh, conclude with a song. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us, Lord. We pray for more of your presence, more of your presence in our life, Lord. Lord, I pray that you do a great and mighty work with people that are struggling with certain relationships. You do something great, Lord, and we look to you. Fill us up. Fill us with your joy. In Jesus' name, amen.